Um, welcome everybody to the 11th session of the International IVF Initiative, or I3 as we call ourselves. Uh, I'm very honored and excited to be co-host hosting this session uh, of the International IVF Initiative with Danny Sackets today, who you hopefully can see uh, on this screen. Um, we very much regret, I'm, I'm standing in here for Marlene Engel, we very much regret that she can't be here. She initiated this session. Uh, she can unfortunately not be attending because of a sudden death in her immediate family. And our best wishes go out to her, of course, and her husband, as well as the entire family. Um, my name is Jacques Cohen. I'm standing in for Marlene as one of your moderators for today's session entitled Moving Sperm Forward an intimate examination of developments in the world of sperm tozoa. This is the often forgotten gamete. Uh, I'm joined today by another sperm lover, Dr. Danny Sucker, scientific director for Boston IVF. And like me, he seems totally comfortable with the subject. Danny, what do you exactly. think? Yep, no, I'm fine. So um, just, uh, just to let you know, both Jack and I have conflict of interest. We both produce sperm, so I just make <laughs> sure that you are you know that we're going to be biased when we're asking questions. So um, we said before, anyone, anyone tuning in to hear anything about eggs, uh, you're on the wrong channel. So yeah. but we hope uh, we can get this uh, talk going. And um, Jacques, do you want to introduce yeah. our speakers? Yeah, our speakers today are specialists in the area of sperm function and represent industry, academia, and the clinical lab. So it's a diverse but exclusive group. Behind the scenes, we have the Stella I3 teams, as well as Dr. Matas Roque from the Sao Paulo, uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brian Lomanto from Arizona, Eva Schenkman from North Carolina, Alison Bartolucci from Connecticut, Cynthia Hudson from New York, and of course, Liesel Neltemat from Colorado. For any disclosures and bios of speakers and moderators, please refer to our site, ivfmeeting.com. Please note that all questions to the speakers must be asked through the Q&A fe feature. Please do not use the chat function for questions as our panelists will not be responding to questions asked on the chat function. Submitted questions will be answered either verbally by the speakers or in writing by the panelists today or after the session. Answers will be posted on the website. You're always welcome to go back there and see the questions being asked and answers given. In addition, please do not use the Q&A chat area for solicitation of any products or company. Also, this session will be recorded and is later available via link on our site. Uh, we have three outstanding speakers today. We, we are really, really lucky. They are Ashok Agarwal from the Cleveland Clinic, Matt Feldman from DX Now, and Sandro Estevez from Androvert in Brazil. Uh, Danny, please go ahead and introduce the first speaker and uh, his work. Thank you, Jacques. Um, so it seems that andrology is analogous with uh, Dr. Ashak Agarwal, who is our first speaker today. Um, I think his, uh, his middle name should be Sperm because he publishes so many papers on the subject. Um, he's published not only more about the field of andrology than anyone in the past, I think. Uh, he has up to 740 peer-reviewed papers and he has more publications than any other scientist in the reproductive medicine field, which is an amazing achievement. Um, he has probably another 20 or 30 years to go in the field, so we can await some more uh, um, hallmark uh, from him. So it'll be interesting to see what comes up next. Um, Ashok is the Director of Andrology and the Head of Research at the American Center for Reproductive Medicine at Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He's professor of urology at the Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. As I said before, he has over 30 years of experience in directing busy male infertility diagnostic centers and fertility preservation services. He's actively guiding translational research, clinical translational research in male infertility, where his interests include proteomics of male infertility and studies of key molecular markers such as oxidative stress, obviously, which is very uh, well known for, and DNA integrity, and the pathophysiology of male reproduction. It's a really great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Ashok Agarwal, who will now present uh, his, our first lecture today. Thank you, Ashok. 
Um, so, um, good afternoon from Cleveland. Um, I have, uh, I want to thank the organizers, uh, the International IVF Initiative, uh, which is uh, the driving force behind organizing these uh, fantastic uh, uh, webinars uh, of the highest quality over the last uh, uh, four weeks. Uh, and this is the brainchild of uh, a very select group of uh, ARTNs. Uh, and uh, I want to personally thank each and every one of them uh, for doing such a fantastic job. I think uh, as you see the quality of these programs over the last uh, several weeks have been just, uh, uh, just amazing. And uh, there is so much knowledge and new information that has been brought uh, to all of you. So thank you very much uh, to the entire team headed by Jacques and, uh, and Peter and uh, so many, especially Thomas. Um, I also want to thank uh, the moderators, um, uh, both Jacques, uh, Marlen is, could not be here and I am sorry for her loss uh, and also um, Danny. And uh, um, so today I will be uh, talking about uh, the artificial intelligence driven innovations in automated semen analysis, building a better mousetrap. So semen analysis is uh, the most important test, which is uh, the test that is uh, ordered for every single infertile couple, which needs uh, to be examined. And this is the most fundamental test. Uh, it has been uh, used uh, for every single couple who is going on for infertility workup. And uh, for a long time, uh, since the discovery of uh, the microscope in 1600s by Leuven Hook, uh, about more than 300 years ago, um, there has been very little development in terms of uh, changes in a routine semen analysis. So there have been uh, many attempts to standardize the method of semen analysis, which uh, was uh, actually uh, standardized using the WHO um, guidelines from 1980, about 40 years ago. And since then, five different editions of guidelines have been published. Um, and the latest is the fifth edition, which is the 2010 uh, guideline. And uh, it provides uh, the laboratories uh, standardized protocol and methods uh, in order to perform uh, semen analysis in the most accurate way in their own laboratories. However, uh, a routine semen analysis is very subjective and it is very difficult to standardize even uh, under the best circumstances. And uh, according to the CLIA in the United States, uh, this is characterized as a high complexity test. And what it means is that it uh, really requires uh, um, a lot of uh, um, training. It requires qualified uh, personnel it requires quality control, quality assurance, proficiency testing, and uh, a whole gamut of uh, uh, training to perform this test correctly into the laboratory. So despite that, um, can we change? Next slide, please. Um, despite all that, semen analysis is still highly vulnerable to lab errors and human errors. And uh, there is uh, an inbuilt problem within our male reproductive system uh, because we are uh, uh, producing sperm which are highly variable in terms of the production. Uh, there are, uh, the, the sperm sample can be normal anywhere from 15 million to 200 million. There is a huge amount of variability there is a huge amount of variability because of the instrumentation that are being used to measure semen uh, parameters. And that uh, there is a, um, still a lack of uh, consistent observance of uh, standardized protocol in laboratories engaged in conducting the semen analysis. There is a lot of controversy regarding the guidelines which develop the cutoff values for semen parameters by WHO. Still, there is uh, uh, a lot of controversy and criticism about those 
cutoff values or the reference values to identify abnormal semen samples. And uh, despite following the best practices, it does not eliminate variability that can result from technician subjectivity and human error. And the errors can cause misdiagnosis or delayed infertility treatment. Next. Next. And uh, the way that this, this happens is because the manual semen analysis has so many steps. We have to do the check for liquefaction, we have to check for color, the pH, the volume, um, and then load the sample on a counting chamber, place the counting chamber on microscope, do the count, motility, and then clean the counting chamber. So there are, next, there are so many steps uh, that are involved in conducting the semen analysis that uh, they are bound to be mistakes. Next slide. But that is uh, um, not uh, uh, over because uh, semen analysis also includes sperm morphology. And even by the fastest technique called diff quick, there are still 12 steps that are, uh, that are involved in conducting a complete morphological evaluation. Uh, and that can take about 30 to 60 minutes for uh, preparing the smear, uh, staining it, drying it, and then evaluating and scoring the slides. Next slide. So if you take into account all of these uh, issues, uh, next slide, you will see that uh, um, there are so many steps. And since there are so many steps, the chances of mistakes are also very high in conducting manual semen analysis in a clinical laboratory. Next slide. Because of these reasons, over the last 40 years, the development of computer-assisted semen analysis uh, started. And there have been a large number of uh, these systems which have been developed and are available in the market. Um, what you see on the screen are three main companies, and there are so many more which uh, are not here. Uh, Microptic, Hamilton, and uh, MES. And I chose these because these three systems are being used in our laboratory at Cleveland Clinic. We have uh, several of these, almost half a dozen of these system, so I am displaying it uh, to show that there are so many of these systems. And the systems are actually semi-automated. They track the spermatozoa, focusing uh, through the microscope to capture successive images of a sperm within a static field. These systems use uh, a special software to extract desired information and produce desired output. And uh, the issue is that uh, the information generated by these system uh, is overwhelming. Next slide. They provide a large amount of information. In addition to the traditional semen parameters, they also measure a variety of motion kinetics, such as velocity, linearity, amplitude of lateral head movement and brief cross frequency. So there are tons of things uh, that the data is generated. Um, essentially, the advantages of it is uh, that uh, this is, these type of systems are very useful in busy andrology or IVF labs, where there is a high turnover of technologists. Uh, there is a large amount of uh, samples uh, that are coming in. It reduces the inter and intra operator variation and provide some object objectivity. But the downside is that uh, the large amount of data that it generates, most of the data, almost uh, 50, 60% of the data, which is really useful to uh, a program is, has no clinical meaning. So uh, most of the motion kinetic parameter have no clinical value because the reference values for those parameters have not been established by the WHO, and we don't really fully understand the clinical value of those parameters. Next slide. Um, 
So these are the limitations. Uh, um, these are very large uh, instrument, takes a lot of uh, footprint. Um, they require uh, a person to be well trained to handle. So these are not automated devices. These are semi-automated devices, which require considerable amount of training and understanding of the system in order to operate it optimally and in a correct manner. Um, also, these uh, instruments uh, generally are expensive. Next slide. So in light of this, uh, there has been a um, there has been a vacuum in the market for a technological breakthrough. And uh, over the last year or two, um, we have been involved in uh, testing and uh, validating a new device called Lensook X1 Pro. And uh, this is uh, one of the smallest CASA system in the market, which uh, basically uses uh, artificial intelligence algorithm with auto focus optical lens in a single device. Uh, it is also approved by the FDA recently and available in the United States as well as in many parts of the world. More importantly, this device is simple. It takes two to five minutes to measure all the main parameters of the semen pH, concentration, motility, and morphology. Um, it uh, can also measure the pH directly. It can measure the concentration in very low concentration sample, less than a million, 0.1 million, total motility, progressive motility, and non-progressive is pumped between less than 1% to 100% and morphology. So if you look at the diagram, it is really easy for uh, the device when you load the sample, two drops, one for pH and for, for concentration, insert the cassette into the device and you get the results within a few minutes. There is really very little operator um, interaction or, uh, or any kind of uh, specific uh, detailed training. Next slide. So um, recently, about uh, last year, we conducted a small pilot to evaluate uh, this device, uh, which was uh, then published in this uh, journal. Uh, but now today, next slide. Um, I wanted to discuss and present some recent data that we have generated in the last six months. Uh, this is unpublished and we are preparing it for publication. So here, uh, this is the experimental design where we had about 101 samples, which were analyzed both manually and by commercial CASA device, Hamilton Thorn, IVOS, and Lensook by WHO fifth edition for important semen parameters, uh, concentration, motility, and progressive motility. Next slide, please. So these are the results here. We have uh, semen samples coming from oligospermic, oligospermic astheno and normo from both patient and donors. And if you look at the table, uh, you will find that there is uh, a very high degree of correlation coefficient between the manual semen analysis and the X1 Pro, um, as well as uh, between the manual and Hamilton Thorn. And in the third row, you will see the results of lens hook correlating very highly with uh, the current uh, uh, industry leader, which is Hamilton Thorn IVO system. And on the right side, you will see the correlations which are being shown uh, on the right side. These are the correlation uh, between lens hook and manual results for concentration motility and progressive motility. Next slide, please. Um, these are the performance characteristics such as PPV, NPV sensitivity specificity for all the semen parameters between manual semen analysis and X1, X1 Pro, which is the lens hook semen analyzer. All performance characteristics are very good for manual semen analysis versus X1 Pro. The PPV was 100% of a positive predictive value uh, for identifying true positive is 100% for uh, Lenso and about 86% for asthenol zeus samples, which is uh, fairly good. Next slide. So here we looked at the intra-observer agreement which is important and essentially 
10 samples were analyzed by the same person for manual and X1 Pro, uh, and each sample was analyzed three times for all these semen parameters. Next slide. And these are the results. We have um, um, very high degree of uh, intra-observer agreement for concentration, total motility, and progressive motility using X1 Pro. And these are comparable to manual semen analysis. Next slide. Now looking at the inter-observer, which is essentially between the different operators. So you will see three operator counting 10 samples of by manual and X1 Pro for all the semen parameters. Next slide. And these are the results. We have again, very high degree of inter observer agreement of more than 0.9% or 90% for spawn concentration, total motility and progressive motility using X1 Pro. The results again for X1 uh, for Lenso are comparable to manual semen analysis, which is conducted by a trained technologist. Next slide, please. So here, um, the take home message of my uh, talk here is this new technology is uh, um, very precise. Uh, it uh, shows very good degree of agreement uh, with manual semen analysis being performed by a trained technologist. It is fast, it is simple to operate, offers reliable and reproducible results. Um, it uh, is very easy to perform and get all the semen parameters within the laboratory while uh, the patient is waiting, for example, and uh, meeting with the physician within a few minutes, you can conduct and provide these results uh, without uh, the patient to be called or he has to schedule to come back again. And that is one of uh, the very important uh, characteristics uh, of this uh, technology. Next slide, please. So there are some limitations uh, of the device. Uh, I believe uh, um, that morphology is one of the issue with this uh, that the results of this device does not correlate very well with manual semen analysis. And there are some reasons for it. Um, it uh, cannot examine multiple fields. The technology examine only a single field and takes multiple video, although it checks 100 grids. It does not uh, examine the acrosomal region, although it can evaluate the shape from head to tail in order to classify them as a sperm. It has machine learning. Um, it uh, uh, really, I think the results of sperm morphology, even by IVO system in our, pro, uh, in our hand, showed very poor correlation with the manual semen analysis. So uh, the company is uh, in developing a newer algorithm to examine morphology using the stain slides in their newer model. And we know that uh, morphology is the hardest thing to standardize and uh, be able to automate. I think uh, if you look at uh, the development of all the CASA system, uh, morphology has not been standardized so far. So I believe uh, that uh, this type of technology is uh, going to be a disruptor in the market. Uh, the change is uh, inevitable and uh, it is essentially the survival of the fittest so the technology is changing faster than we can imagine. And what we see here is uh, the, something that I believe personally is uh, the new CASA uh, for the future. May I have the next? Can you click on that? Anyway, um, there was a music uh, with that. So I, I guess let me see if I can play that. So, um, and then just the last slide.
Thank you very much. And uh, I apologize for uh, the screw up in the beginning. Um, despite uh, it shows that despite all the practices that we did, um, it uh, the technology can sometimes uh, um, really escape you when you really need it the most. But uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Uh, it was an excellent presentation, even with the, the slight hiccups. Um, just so we don't have any hiccups for the next talk, can um, I ask Matt Feldman to get his slides ready just before, while we're, while we're actually going through some of the questions for Dr. Agarwal. So um, obviously, you know, we have many, many questions uh, that, that come through. Um, so we'll just um, pinpoint two or three quick ones. Um, some are, there's, there are a few questions, Dr. Agarwal, on the performance of the instrument. Um, one is whether it's a deep learning system. And another one is sort of the maximum and minimum values of um, some of the characteristics and the classic ones of uh, what volumes can it handle, uh, count, motility, and maybe morphology. So if you could just um, maybe comment on, on those two questions for now. So um, from what I was... Uh told uh, since I'm not involved in the development of the device. So I discussed this with the company and uh, from their R&D department, they told that they have used uh, the, the machine learning. It is not uh, the deep learning uh, because they were able to characterize uh, the cells very clearly in terms of uh, their shape and uh, size and, uh, and inputted uh, this information, which is the basis for uh, um, for it to be very successful in most of the parameter except morphology, which perhaps will need uh, deep learning in order to teach the system uh, to be able to look at uh, so many different uh, shapes and forms, uh, which is uh, the biggest issue with the morphology. In terms of uh, uh, the, the minimums and uh, maximum uh, values uh, of the parameters, uh, I believe uh, for concentration, um, it can measure anything uh, less than 0.1 to 300 milli, uh, million is pump per ml. Uh, unlike in re, uh, routine CASA devices, we know that uh, anything below a uh, certain uh, concentration or above certain concentration is always uh, uh, become uh, very suspicious. The results are not very accurate. And uh, for low concentration, traditionally people do manual semen analysis, anything above, below 10 million, and anything above 100 million, again, you have to dilute the sample. Uh, in Lensuk, there is no need for diluting the sample. Uh, in terms of the total motility, uh, the cutoff uh, for performance is less than 1% to about 100%. And same thing goes for morphology, less than 1 to 100%. Um, obviously, we have a lot of questions about prices and things like that. I think that may vary according to where you're logging in from. So I, I, I don't think we should get into discussions about pricing. Um, some of the questions that are coming through are, are, are what volume of, of actually the number of patients this could handle and where you would find it useful in terms of, um, of using it in a laboratory. So can you just comment on you know, how busy your lab is? Obviously, you're doing a lot of samples. <laughs> and where you would find it useful in terms of um, implementing this type of instrumentation and how it differs to a CASA machine maybe? Um, well, I mean, I think uh, there are so many important differences. Uh, so let me start uh, in terms of the volume. Um, a traditional CASA analysis uh, can take uh, at a minimum about uh, 20 minutes uh, and maybe more. Uh, this uh, instrument, uh, semen analysis, takes about uh, five minutes. Um, it includes, uh, you don't have to take the volume or pH, everything is uh, done in a self-contained cup, which uh, has uh, been configured to provide the volume and, uh, and uh, also be able to provide the, uh, when you put a drop of the semen on the cassette, it gives you the pH. In terms of the number of semen analysis that can be done, I think uh, you can do large number. We have done 30 or 40 semen analysis in uh, about four or five hours. So that is uh, a fairly large number of semen analysis. Of course, these were for evaluation purposes. But clinically, yes, this can be done. 
um, and we see its role in uh, very small to medium to large laboratories um, because uh, uh, the, the requirement for conducting uh, is so easy that you don't really need to invest a lot of time in training the personnel uh, in this technology. The usage of this technology is really very easy. So um, that cuts down the time. And, uh, and there is, uh, um, you can provide the results while the physician is waiting. And that is something which is unheard of in uh, most of the uh, laboratory procedure where patient give the sample, then they have uh, to call or they have to wait for several days for the results to be announced. And since even the morphology, which does not correlate right now very well, and hopefully it will improve in future, uh, if we can provide the complete results uh, within five minutes to the physician, I think that uh, uh, provides a, a very high level of satisfaction for the for the patient. Um, so I see its role in, uh, I mean, from my vantage point, uh, I, I think this is a disruptor technology. Uh, I believe that uh, um, most of the CASA will go off. Uh, I mean, I have six of them, so I am not uh, okay. looking forward to changing them, but yep. uh, it uh, is so easy and we plan to uh, implement that clinically in our, uh, in our program. Okay, thanks Ashok. I'll hand over to Jack now to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Ashok. Uh, uh, so very good information, all of that. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Feldman from DX Now to talk about recent developments in the area of microfluidics and sperm preparation, separation. After training in human genetics and biochemistry at Johns Hopkins, Matt now identifies himself as a recovering scientist and a champion for medical innovation. He is the communications director at DX Now, and he will talk about the Zymod uh, product. Welcome, Matt. Thanks very much, Jacques. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, beautiful. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Feldman, communications director at Zymod Fertility. Thank you to the i3 team for, for having me today. I'm really excited to speak with you about microfluidics and the future of sperm prep. So let's get into it. The first IVF cycles in young women with block tubes used simple washes of semen to remove seminal plasma. This worked well enough for IUI and most women with tubal disease. So the proportion of male factor patients was low for these early patients, a, a simple sperm washing was sufficient. But as time went by and indications expanded for IVF treatment, this was when we started seeing failed fertilization for patients who didn't have ideal sperm parameters. The next generation of processing, swim-ups, worked better for more patients. But swim-up didn't work well for male factor patients and many idiopathic patients. In the late 80s, processing evolved to using multiple layers of gradients made of colloidal silica, known as Percol at the time, and now as products like sperm grad. But this approach, uh, it's commonly used today and involves layering sperm over multiple gradients, followed by centrifugation, washing, and recentrifugation. It's an approach that has endured for, for over 30 years. But I wanna share a quote with you from David Mortimer's landmark paper in 1991. He said, there is now incontrovertible evidence that the centrifugal pelleting of unselected human sperm populations causes irreversible damage to the spermatozoa, which can impair the fertilizing ability of the modal fraction. Five plus decades of innovation have changed the way you perform IVF, handling and evaluating the egg and the embryo but labs continue to use similar centrifugation-based methods as they prep samples for IUI, IVF, and ICSI. So for decades, we've known that spinning sperm is not the best approach. And in addition to the potential impacts on sperm health, there are also 40 or 50 plus ways to conduct density gradient centrifugation preps. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is far from a standardized approach. Microfluidics has been seen as a potential evolutionary step beyond the spin. And the industry has been hungry to do something different, something better, something faster, something easier, ideally something that's all three. 
but only in the last few years has the technology really caught up to that hunger, actually enabling us to make changes. From an historical standpoint, this is what Mortimer was talking about. Centrifugation triggers reactive oxygen species exposure during the centrifugation process. The physical forces of centrifugation itself, usually performed at 500 G, can damage sperm. So for example, the world's most aggressive roller coasters exert five Gs of force on riders' bodies, five times the force of gravity. And I know how rattled I feel when I step off of those rides. So that gives you some indication of the potential impact on sperm at orders of magnitude more force. DNA damage can negatively impact motility and lead to negative outcomes like decreased fertilization rates, decreased embryo quality, and decreased pregnancy rates. But the bottom line is this. Nature doesn't use centrifugation to determine which sperm are available for fertilization. Sperm swim through cervical mucus on their way to an egg, with the mucus acting like a filter. And in 2013, this led to an insight. The specific properties of cervical mucus could be mimicked as a microfluidic channel and enable us to achieve more positive outcomes. In the reproductive sphere, the work from the labs of Gary Smith and Shu Takayama put microfluidics on the map. Their device used miniaturized valves, pumps, along with laminar flow through channels to produce highly modal sperm. But sample throughput was an issue there. In 2013, scientists and engineers found that a four millimeter wide channel, 20 millimeters long, using a 30 minute incubation time, created an environment for optimal tail movement that was associated with straight line progressive motility, enabling the separation of the most modal and functional sperm with extremely low levels of DNA fragmentation. The Demerci group designed a microfluidic device that mimicked nature. The current iterations of the Demerci device now use 850 microliters of raw semen input, producing 500 microliters of output with close to 100% modal sperm. No further centrifugation or processing is needed after withdrawing the sample from the device. It's just ready to use. So let's look at some of the results. These are data on DNA fragmentation from a 2018 paper from the Rosen Group at UCSF, looking at 70 split samples. Separation without centrifugation in a microfluidics device yielded sperm with significantly lower levels of DNA fragmentation, actually nearly undetectable levels when compared to density gradient centrifugation and the neat unprocessed specimen. In a 2019 study of 30 patients actually presented here to this group last week by Dr. Broussard, Microfluidics processed sperm showed significantly less DNA fragmentation when compared to two brands of density gradient uh, uh, columns and density gradient plus swim up. As she mentioned, the device also significantly reduced OSA levels, uh, oxidative stress adducts, a measure of oxidative stress, and high DNA stainability, a measurement of immature cells and high histone retention. Uh, Dr. Broussard concluded that the quality of the sample improved after microfluidic sperm separation device use. That's without any centrifugation. So let's look beyond the lab. Outcomes matter. In an unpublished retrospective study of over 3,600 oocytes at the Fertility and IVF Center of Miami, the center observed a significant increase in fertilization rates, an 11% increase over baseline compared to traditional centrifugation-based methods. Following the biopsy of over 1,300 embryos, a 48% euploidy rate improved significantly to 58% with microfluidics sperm separation devices, an increase of 21% over baseline. Uh, 
But I do want to offer a few caveats here. This wasn't a prospective randomized study, and there's more to learn about the mechanisms at work and the, and the populations for whom this device was, was used uh, in their treatment. But I can tell you that a large university group has submitted an IRB to conduct a prospectively randomized sibling O site study to examine more of these questions. And I look forward to being able to talk more about that growing body of evidence in the future. In another unpublished analysis from 2019, the Aji Bottom Healthcare Group, one of the largest hospital chains in the world, compared sperm preparation via density gradient separation uh, to preparation with microfluidic separation devices. This data set covers over 1,800 ICSI cycles performed over two years. Patients in the microfluidic group had significantly more positive pregnancy outcomes, an adjusted increase of almost 10%. But one thing that's really important to note, demographically, the female patients in the sperm separation device cohort were actually older and smoked more. These are factors expected to actually decrease their chances of success. So controlling for these differences may increase the effect of avoiding centrifugation even more. This is one patient population for whom sperm separation devices showed a statistically significant impact. Uh, there was another paper in mid-2019 out of Turkey that did not find a difference in pregnancy outcomes between the two PrEP methods. So understanding more about these populations and the molecular and physiological basis for the results is why we are pursuing additional studies. We want to learn more. Oops. In a September paper in JARG from the Palermo Group at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York, sperm separation uh, devices were directly compared to density gradient methods. So this is a complex effort to summarize quickly here in just one slide. So I urge you to read the full paper for all the details on this, this large effort. But in two patient cohorts with a history of unexplained infertility, processing with and processing samples with microfluidic separation devices improved sperm sample quality as measured by motility, morphology, and levels of DNA fragmentation. In another cohort, device use followed by fresh embryo transfer resulted in a 50% clinical pregnancy rate in a group of patients that had experienced a 0% implantation rate in previous IVF cycles, which used density gradient centrifugation. In the remaining patients using microfluidics devices who underwent PGTA prior to a frozen embryo transfer, micro, the microfluidics patients saw a statistically significant increase in the number of euploid embryos and an 80% ongoing pregnancy rate compared to density gradient centrifugation prepped patients. So outcomes matter. And again, here, uh, the Palermo group showed that avoiding centrifugation matters. ICSI isn't the only place where microfluidics are making waves. We know that historically, pregnancy rates following IUI treatment are low, and couples with DNA fragmentation issues have additional challenges with IUI treatment, challenges that reduce their odds of success. In a retrospective study in Fertility and Sterility, published late last year, authors examined outcomes in 265 IUI patients with unexplained infertility. Patients whose samples were processed using sperm separation devices showed similar total modal count, but were significantly more likely to achieve ongoing pregnancy than patients whose samples were processed with density gradient centrifugation. With microfluidic sperm separation, the adjusted odds of having an ongoing pregnancy increased by 3.5 times. One important note here again is that when using this sperm separation device for IUI, no centrifugation is needed. The 500 microliter sample is aspirated from the device and is ready to go directly into the IUI catheter. It's really that simple. There's just no centrifugation. So this is really, uh, the IUI space is really an exciting area of focus for us and work is continuing on IUI applications as well as other aspects of sperm health and clinical outcomes for both ICSI and IUI indications. So here's how it works. Hopefully this video will stream. 
there's an inlet port, an outlet port, and a membrane. 850 microliters of raw semen is injected into the inlet port. The sample travels into the lower portion of the device underneath a membrane that has eight micron pores in it. You place fertilization media on top of the membrane and during incubation, the most progressively modal sperm migrate through the pores into the fresh media above. They leave behind the less modal morphologically abnormal sperm. So what is collected from above the membrane are the healthiest, most genomically competent sperm. Whether for ICSI or IUI use, there's no need for any centrifugation of the sample, either before or after device usage. No special media is needed either. You use what you normally use in your lab's workflow. So thank you very much for your time and for your interest. And many thanks again to the I3 team for having me today. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to be in touch. We'll also be answering uh, what's in the Q&A section uh, of the chat and be available after. So thanks again to everybody. Uh, thank you, Matt, for, for this great lecture. And uh, it, it looks really good. Um, this has the potential to see, save us a great deal of time uh, processing sperm is less handling, fewer tubes, possibly better outcomes. And so it is a potential game changer, I think. Um, there are some questions, and while we wait for, for um, Sandro Estevez to load up his, child, uh, his slides, um, just a few questions here, or maybe one question. Um, an important, important one is, um, and I've heard this before, um, any thoughts how to treat a sample with extreme viscosity uh, that won't go through the chamber when we are trying to avoid excessive manipulation of the sample? This is a question from Jessica Blaze. Sure, we've actually seen the devices used successfully with viscous samples. Um, sometimes it takes diluting a little bit with media, other times it takes a mild uh, disruption with the with a large syringe uh, to just almost chop at it. What you don't want to do is risk the shearing forces of say moving it through the cannula of a syringe by quick up and down motion. Those that turbulent flow through a syringe can shear DNA and actually defeat the purpose of using the device in, in the first place. So we have seen people use it successfully with viscous samples and uh, and people have really have really been surprised, I think, at, at the device's ability to handle that. Okay, and, and this is a learning curve. Are there certain tricks? Are there things you have to get used to, or or, or you can you can start this and within a few tries you're you're up and, and ready to go? So actually, a, a little bit of both. It is very easy to use, easy to adopt, very simple to bring into the lab. But there, and, and while it is very simple to use. There are a couple of particular things uh, that, that users need to be mindful of when handling it. And we have all kinds of videos and, and things like that, that, that talk people and, and show people through those procedures. But overall, um, people are thrilled about, about the use, the ease of use and being able to spend about five minutes of, of hands-on time per sample uh, okay. compared to density gradient. Right. Well, thank you very much again for, for your lecture. We'll come back to you later after uh, Dr. Estevez's talk. And Danny, over to you um, to introduce uh, Dr. Estevez. Thank you, Jacques. Uh, it's a great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Sandro Estevez, who is the medical director of the Androfer Clinic in Brazil. Urology. Oh. Sorry. He's also a professor of urology. Uh, and endocrinology. So, sorry. Uh, he has over 25 clinical years of clinical experience in the field of ART, and his research interests include the study of sperm DNA egg fragmentation, obviously, and its effect on infertility and ART outcomes. He has more than 70 papers published in this area. So, today uh, we'll hear about some of the secrets of the sperm DNA fragmentation and when to use it. So, over to you, Sandro. So thank you very much for having me, Danny. I hope you can hear me well. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the organizers for bringing SPUR to the main stage. Uh, also, I would like to greet our participants and panelists 
thank you for, for joining us today. Well, uh, I think the first thing is to start by uh, showing the learning objectives. My idea today is helping you to understand the biological basis of sperm DNA fragmentation and how to measure it. Then we will look at the evidence concerning the adverse impact of sperm DNA fragmentation on art outcomes. And lastly, I will talk about what we can do when we have elevated sperm DNA fragmentation, specifically in couples undergoing ART. So let's start with the basics because a lot of people is confused by uh, definitions, uh, sperm DNA damage and sperm DNA fragmentation. So when we talk about sperm DNA damage, this is a broad term that accounts for many defects in the DNA structure, including single and double DNA strand breaks, but also base deletions or modifications, inter and intra cross linkage, and also DNA protein cross linkage. However, when we talk specifically about sperm DNA fragmentation, it refers to the breaks occurring at the DNA strands and they are termed single or double strand breaks, depending on the partial or whole liberation of each DNA strand respectively. This is important differentiation because most of uh, DNA fragmentation comes from oxidative stress during sperm transit through the epididymis and also post ejaculation. Also DNA fragmentation comes from apoptosis during sperm maturation in the testicle and the epididymis. So if we want to measure sperm DNA fragmentation, we need to look at oxidative stress and apoptosis. DNA damage also accounts for protamination failure, which refers to deficient replacement of histones to protamines during spermatogenesis. But when we look at the clinical patients we see every day, the male infertility patients, they have oxidative stress quite often due to varicocele, due to male accessory gland infections, due to poor lifestyle, other diseases, medication, uh, let's say uh, toxicants, environmental toxicants, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, from the clinical standpoint, oxidative stress needs to be, to be in the main stage because oxidative stress will cause sperm DNA fragmentation. This explanation is important because when you go to the literature, we see many uh, tests uh, proposed to measure sperm DNA fragmentation. The tests that you see in the left side are actually tests for protamination, chromatin compaction, like acridine orange, uh, aniline blue, chromomycin A3, and toluidine blue are not tests actually um, acceptable or providing valid results for sperm DNA fragmentation. By contrast, the tunnel assay sperm chromatin structure assay, sperm chromatin dispersion test, and the comet assays. These four tests are actually uh, tests that will look at specifically sperm DNA fragmentation. So what I want to, uh, to, to say is that if you want to test uh, sperm DNA fragmentation, you need to pick up one of these four tests that I just described because they will be significant for the population that we see in the clinics, I mean patients with oxidative stress. Another thing that I see quite often is people discussing about the reliability technical issues of sperm DNA fragmentation tests. Well, the results provided by one test uh, do not necessarily line up with other tests, but there is a strong correlation among the main uh, tests available. For instance, in this study, which is very well designed in which they look at, uh, this, they split the specimen and then analyze it using different assays. There was a strong correlation between the SCD and SCSA, SCD and tunnel and SCSA and tunnel. Also, when we look at the accuracy of this test to kind of pick up male infertility, you see that the test performed quite good. Also, the alkaline comet assay performed quite good. But what is very interesting is that when you look at the cutoff points, we see that when we discuss tunnel SCSA and SCD, 
the cutoff point of about 20% seems to be uh, reliable actually to distinguish male infertility diagnosis. So the results of the previous study is actually consistent with this uh, re very recent study published uh, in 2018 in which the authors look at approximately um, 4,000 men uh, and then they analyze it the thresholds that would be ideal to distinguish male infertility from fertile patients. And again, the threshold of 20% uh, was actually the best threshold for this sort of discrimination. The only remark that I have with this study is that only one uh, included study actually look at the comment essay. So this information about threshold of 20% is actually uh, valid if we consider in my opinion, the SESA tunnel and SCD. We have uh, provided some, uh, some recommendations. This is a study led by Dr. Agarwal, in which I had the pleasure to participate. This is uh, one of the few guidelines on sperm DNA fragmentation we have in the literature so far. And in this study, we provided indications for sperm DNA fragmentation, but we also provide some technical, let's say, tips for clinics and doctors willing to use sperm DNA fragmentation testing. This is important to know that we should use the neat semen for sperm DNA fragmentation testing, not the process semen, because sperm DNA fragmentation is a marker of sperm quality that has to be analyzed in the neat semen. The other important thing is that the ejaculatory abstinence should be around two to three days. The longer the, abden the abstinence, the higher the sperm DNA fragmentation. So we need actually to control for that. And obviously we need a, a standardized protocol with quality control when we are running these tests. Well, in terms of ART, which is the main topic of my, my speech, uh, the question is, should DNA testing be recommended before assisted reproductive technology? In order to, uh, to answer these questions, we need, first of all, to answer, to answer if uh, the elevated DNA fragmentation actually affect our outcomes, and if so, if we have something to offer the patients. So let's first discuss the impact of sperm DNA fragmentation on the probability of pregnancy by both conventional IVF and ICSI. This, uh, to my knowledge, is the best study published uh, so far in which the author summarized the evidence of approximately 20,000 patients in which they look at the odds for successful pregnancy by fertilization method named IVF and ICSI. As you can see, the odds for successful pregnancy was actually reduced when the couple had high sperm DNA fragmentation. The authors also look at uh, the different assays and the impact of using one over the other in terms of predicting the probability of pregnancy. Uh, again, using any of the assays, you'll be able to pick up, let's say, a condition in which will impact the probability of pregnancy by ICSI and conventional IVF. So uh, in practical terms, regardless of the test you use, if you have it done with proper quality control, it will provide valid information for the clinician to say, to counsel the patients and to identify who are at risk of having less probability of pregnancy in both ICSI and IVF. The other important thing related to sperm DNA fragmentation is miscarriage after pregnancy is achieved using ART. So we have several systematic reviews and meta-analysis available. Uh, in general, they are consistent showing that the relative risk of having a miscarriage is twice as high if couple has high DNA fragmentation. So I want to translate these numbers to you with a, a very, uh, let's say, uh, simple example. Let's consider now an IVF center performing about 1,000 uh, cycles per year with a reported clinical pregnancy rate of 40%. If we take the study of ZAO published in Fertility Serenity, 
and using the odds ratio in that study of 2.7. I mean, this author showed that high DNA fragmentation had an adverse effect on miscarriage. We can then translate these numbers and then we will see that if you neglect the impact of DNA fragmentation, the clinic might lose up to 82 pregnancies than expected. So it will mean an absolute live birth reduction of up to 20%, which is quite significant. Obviously, we need to consider that infertility is a couple's problem. A test like DNA fragmentation is a single test of gamut dysfunction from just one partner. So obviously it's limited to predict the treatment outcome. But what we know is that the probability of successful pregnancy outcome is impacted by sperm DNA fragmentation. However, it's modulated by female age. So we need to think clinical because if I have a patient with high DNA fragmentation and the uh, female partner, she's very young, the oocyte could have, uh, let's say, cytoplasmic properties to counteract some of the sperm DNA fragmentation. On the contrary, if the lady is, let's say, over 35 years old, the capacity of the oocyte to repair sperm DNA fragmentation will be decreased, and then the impact of DNA fragmentation will be more remarkable. So this is an important consideration. What I'm trying to convey is that sperm DNA fragmentation test is not replacement for the current tools for infertility diagnosis, but in, it offers independent information about the male gametes and also implementation of these tests in the infertility clinics might allow for better treatment planning. So we have the evidence indicating that yes, sperm DNA fragmentation adversely impacts ART outcome. And then the next question will be what we can do about that. So I would like to share with you uh, this paper that we uh, published recently in Andrology with uh, Dani Santi and Manuela Simoni from Italy, in which we uh, uh, summarize the existing evidence on the clinical and surgical interventions to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation in infertile men. This paper is uh, free access, so you can download if you want to look at it. I just was informed by the, by the editors of Andrology that this paper was considered one of the top downloaded papers over the last weeks. So I was very happy that the interest was there. And in this paper, we look at different, let's say, interventions that could perhaps offer benefit, such as, uh, such as changing the lifestyle, uh, avoiding smoking, obesity, or exposure to toxicants, oral antioxidant therapy, treatment of underlying conditions, I mean varicose seal repair, uh, treatment of genital tract infections, and also controlling diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and so on. Use of hormonal therapy, uh, in particular uh, FSH uh, therapy for men with a, uh, idiopathic sperm DNA fragmentation, and lastly, ART using uh, testicular sperm in preference over ejaculated sperm. So what we concluded in this paper was that treating the underlying male infertility factor is a good way to alleviate sperm DNA fragmentation and increase the likelihood of achieving natural and assisted con conception. But we realized that the data remain uh, limited. The best evidence we have at the moment concerns varicose seal repair and also gonadotropin therapy with the use of follicle stimulating hormone. Concerning antioxidant therapy and lifestyle changes, these interventions might alleviate oxidative stress markers and decrease sperm DNA fragmentation. However, the effects on pregnancy outcomes is still unclear. Lastly, among men with high DNA fragmentation undergoing ART, testicular sperm in preference of over ejaculated sperm for ICSI has been shown to improve pregnancy rates. I would like to show a study we did a, a few years ago. This is a prospective non-randomized study we published in Fertility Serenity looking at use of testicular sperm for ICSI in men with high sperm DNA fragmentation. So in this paper, actually we look at a uh, also, the, uh, we measured DNA fragmentation in, in the semen and in testicular specimens uh, of those men who we actually did sperm retrieval. So at the day of sperm retrieval, we actually asked these patients to produce and ejaculate. 
And on that day, we measured using a sperm chromatin dispersion test using a fluorescence, let's say, protocol that was very convenient to kind of identify sperm uh, and distinguish from other cells, we found a about 80% relative reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation with stiffer sperm compared to ejaculated sperm. When we look at ICSI outcomes, we found that using testicular sperm for ICSI instead of ejaculated sperm in those couples uh, provided significant reduction of miscarriage and significant increase in live birth. In this particular study, the number needed to treat by test ICSI, I mean testicular sperm ICSI versus ejaculated sperm ICSI to achieve one additional delivery was about five. So subsequently, we did a study, this with my, my colleague, Mateus Roque, also Nicolas Garrido from Nivi and uh, Cara Bradley from, from Australia. We summarized the evidence in this systematic review and meta-analysis, and then we again concluded that there is evidence indicating that testicular sperm for ICSI uh, in men uh, with high post-testicular sperm DNA fragmentation could improve reproductive outcomes compared with ejaculated sperm. Well, we still don't have randomized controlled trials in this area. We are actually uh, providing the evidence based on prospective studies as well as retrospective studies. So the evidence that we have at the moment is that sperm DNA fragmentation has an adverse effect on art and treating the underlying male infertility factors might be used to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation, including consideration for the use of testicular sperm might increase uh, art outcomes. This is, exactly, uh, this is exactly what we are doing in our center we offer sperm DNA fragmentation testing for all couples embarking on ART. So looking at our data, as you can see, about 53% of patients have DNA fragmentation using the sperm chromatin dispersion test of 20% or greater. 25% of our population have sperm DNA fragmentation uh, results uh, over than 30%. So our algorithm that we have published and we are using in clinical practice, we test sperm DNA fragmentation. If it's high, we try to uh, identify the underlying conditions that could be treated, including varicose tissue repair, lifestyle changes, genital infection with antibiotics, so on. And then if it's possible to treat, we reanalyze three, four months later again with sperm DNA fragmentation testing. If results remain high, we offer testicular sperm for ICSI. Uh, uh, on the other side, if we don't have anything to offer, I mean, we could not identify any underlying condition to kind of a, uh, work with, we offer testicular sperm for ICSI. Well, uh, I would like also to touch upon some interventions that the embryologists, uh, I know that several of you work uh, in the lab, you are not clinicians. So uh, you are, uh, let's say, all, often asked about the laboratory methods to decrease sperm DNA fragmentation for use in ART. We have many of them. And as you can see in this table, just to summarize it very briefly, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation is quite variable. Some methods like microfluidics shows a massive reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation, but in general, all of these methods provide some reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation. However, we need not only to look at the reduction in sperm DNA fragmentation, we need also to look at the clinical endpoint, which is important for the patient, that is live birth. So we have two randomized control trials now showing that a, a removal of DNA fragmented sperm using, for instance, PIXI, this is a paper published in Lancet, and the other uh, uh, paper was on flow cytometry, both randomized control trials. Uh, concluded that although the methods were very good to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation, they did not provide uh, advantage in terms of live birth rate. So any method should be able not only to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation, but also translate into better pregnancy outcome. 
to my knowledge, the only study that have looked at, uh, let's say, tail to tail comparison among the technates, this is a, uh, it's this retrospective study by the group of uh, Australia, Genia, in which they, uh, they compared testicular sperm for XC, PICC, MC, and no intervention. I mean, no intervention. They have used the conventional gradient centrifugation for sperm preparation. And they concluded that the best method, actually, in terms of providing an increase in life birth was use of testicular sperm for XC. So then we, need to, uh, then we need to understand why is that testicular sperm could offer better results than uh, laboratory methods or removing sperm DNA fragmentation from ejaculated semen. And I think the best, let's say, evidence comes from this paper from the group of Monica Muratori, in which they look at the effect of uh, the epididymis uh, the oxidative uh, attack by free radicals during sperm transit through the epididymis. And as you can see, uh, there is a lot of oxidation that will cause at the end, a population of ejaculated sperm with not only sperm DNA fragmentation, but other defects. By contrast, when you look at the testicular specimens, we have some defects there, but uh, uh, the sperm that is mature in the testicle, and we know they are uh, several mature sperm in that particular part, they are, let's say, uh, not affected by the oxidative stress that will occur during epididymis transit. One important consideration is what I'm showing there in the screen is that uh, in many cases, you might have sperm that has been oxidized and not yet showing DNA fragmentation. However, there are epigenetic abnormalities after oxidation, like for instance, methylation defects that will affect the embryo development and implantation, thus explaining why uh, reducing sperm DNA fragmentation in the ejaculate alone might not provide the best answer for uh, improving live birth. I strongly believe we need to treat the male to improve the health, the reproductive health. And if not possible, then we need to provide consideration for use of testicular sperm. Uh, in conclusions, um, I would like to leave you with some key uh, messages in terms of the evidence indicating that sperm DNA fragmentation contributes to infertility and has an adverse impact on our reproductive outcomes. The DNA fragmentation testing provides information about the chromatin, the sperm chromatin at the molecular level, and it has a positive impact on diagnosis because we can better, uh, let's say, identify conditions that we could treat and improve. Also counseling because we can tell our patient, listen, we have a condition here that will make the situation a little bit more difficult for you. Let's try to overcome in some way or mitigate these effects. And then clinical man management because it will take three, four months for us clinicians to provide some interventions that would make the situation better for the couple. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sandra. It was an excellent review on the, the role of sperm DNA fragmentation. I think um, bodes well for following up. I'll just ask you one quick question, and um, I, I hope all the speakers can be quick in their answers when we're starting the general discussion. So just one quick, quick question about how, how much is the sort of the risk of unknown confounders in the studies using testicular sperm for decreasing the SDF effect on, on ART outcomes? This is an important question. I think they are confounded. The only way we can actually provide the definitive answer would be to have a well-designed randomized control trials. They are obviously confounders. In the study we did in 2015, we actually enrolled patients with a, a DNA fragmentation higher than 30%. And these patients, we have provided anti oral antioxidant therapy for three months. And our patient population were actually men with kept high DNA fragmentation, Danny, uh, after using the antioxidants. 
And we, in that particular study, we used a man with a sperm concentration from 5 to 15 million. So it was mild, moderate oligosospermia. Uh, and also the female factors in that particular study, it was up to 39 years old. I think female age, for instance, it's an important confounder because, as I briefly mentioned before, the oocyte has some capacity to repair DNA damage, at least when we look at the animal studies. There are studies showing that, but we don't know uh, for sure uh, the ability of the oocyte actually to overcome. So this, let's say, equation, bringing the female uh, into consideration is very important for the clinician to pay, let's say, more value for the sperm DNA fragmentation or not. Okay, so one just quick question, and then I'll open it up to more of a general discussion to include all our panelists. Um, how can you use DNA fragmentation in a more specific day-to-day -day testing scenario? I think that's one of the things that are missing. Um, I think you alluded to how you use it in your lab, but so sort of how could you use it, you know, in a, in a more, you know, daily routine? Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, this is a, uh, the guidelines that we put together, uh, the guideline that I mentioned led by, by, by Dr. Agarwal, in which uh, he actually um, had the contribution of many andrologists in that particular field, uh, then we look at the best evidence available in the indications for sperm DNA fragmentation. And we found that there are four main categories. The first one is, uh, let's say, a patient with varicocele, clinical varicocele, in which the semen analysis is still shows, let's say, adequate uh, uh, results. So the clinician is not sure if he should, she should recommend uh, fixing the varicocele. In that particular uh, category, having sperm DNA fragmentation tests could help the clinician to decide, well, we have chromatin damage. Uh, varicocele is an important factor in the pathophysiology of oxidative stress and sperm DNA fragmentation. So in that category, the test could help the clinician to decide, okay, I need to fix this varicocele because the data shows that after varicocele repair, the DNA fragmentation is decreased and pregnancy prospects in some studies are increased. The second category is unexplained infertility. Now we have a, uh, patients with a, you know, in which we cannot provide a diagnosis and unexplained infertility, we can say that about 25% of these couples, they have DNA fragmentation as country contribution for, for that condition. The same in this category, we have failure IUI in which it has been shown that doing IUI with very high DNA fragmentation is the results in terms of pregnancy is very low. So the second category, I would say patients with uh, unexplained infertility, failed IUI and recurrent miscarriage. So recurrent miscarriage uh, was also considered in the recent ASHRAE guidelines on recurrence pregnancy loss. Uh, they suggested that sperm DNA fragmentation tests could add value for, for explan uh, explanatory purpose. So the third condition goes to ART. ART, I'm talking about couples having a failure after conventional IUI and IV and ICSI, uh, in which we do not appreciate a very remarkable effect of let's say the, the oocyte quality and so on, or bad quality sperm. So if we have failed ART, consideration to sperm DNA fragmentation is, is important. And, and the last group would be patients with risk factors. So we encounter these patients in our clinics every day, obese patients, smokers, I mean, uh, people uh, exposed to, let's say some tox uh, toxicants, uh, using medication uh, like uh, anti-hypertensives, uh, antidepressants. I mean, it's obvious that uh, the doctor consults his patients to quit, to reduce the exposition, but it's very hard for the patient sometimes to agree because they say, my friend smokes much heavier than me and uh, he can still have five uh, kids. So my point is having a laboratory evidence of that something is very wrong with sperm, we could provide, let's say, more value for the information that the clinician will tell the patient to change the lifestyle or pay the ultimate price. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jacques, do you want to kick off with a more general question? I think we have about another 10 minutes or so. 
and uh, we're still approaching a thousand sperm sperm nerds. So I think uh, we've still got quite a few people interested in in going further. Yeah, and and panelists, uh, if you feel feel free to jump into comment, uh, just raise your hand. Hopefully, we'll see you, and then Thomas will acknowledge you, and you can ask a question. Um, so uh, there are a lot of questions. So please, speakers, if we can keep it very, very short, because there are a lot of questions and we want to get to quite a bit of them. Um, so a um, question here um, for, about lens hook. Sometimes, and this is a question from Hasham Abbas, sometimes an azoospermic patient, lens hook can count round sound in concentration. How serious is this problem? Um, well, the lowest concentration required for doing uh, a semen analysis is this, there has to be some sperm, at least 0.1 million or 100,000. So if the sample really does not have any sperm, it's a totally azoospermic, uh, I don't think you require uh, to do a proper semen analysis in those samples. So I, I, I don't think uh, a semen analysis uh, on a computer will uh, be of any value. Um, to really tell whether there are any sperm, you can really simply examine it in the microscope and you don't see any cells. If there are only round cells, uh, that is really not something that uh, needs to be counted on the lens hook. If that is probably what he's asking. Uh, I yeah. so, so are you suggesting to just always have a quick look at a, at a, at a droplet? Is that what you... That's yeah, I mean, I think you have to, uh, to check uh, if uh, the sample does have some sperm. If it is a, as a spermic sample, uh, it really uh, is not going to be evaluated by, by the device. It, uh, uh, in order, the, the range for it, uh, for doing the concentration check is between 100,000 uh, to 300 million. So yep. there has to be some sperm in order for the machine to work. Yeah. Question for Matt. Um, what stops the best sperm swimming back through the membrane, establishing an equilibrium? Does that happen? We don't have any data to suggest that it, it does or it doesn't, but in generally in 30 minutes, I don't think that there would be enough time for that to happen, but there isn't a, a, a gate system to make that a one-way valve. Uh, yeah. So, but that, that hasn't been something that we've investigated. A question from uh, Brad Reggio. Uh, um, he's asking, what is the average volume of selected sperm that can be collected from the outlet? The question is good, I think, because um, you, would you always use this as ICSI or, or it doesn't matter? You could use it for IVF, right? You could, you could. Yeah, our, our instructions are very clear that 500 microliters is the limit of, of withdrawing from the device. And, and you can go directly into an IUI catheter with that and, and use all of it, or you could use just a few for ICSI. Yeah, pick it up directly in an IUI catheter. You don't have to have directly. it up in between. Okay. So I think a, a general question, you know, I think, Quite a few people are asking about frozen sperm. So um, I think, a, you know, a general question, I think, to Ashok about analysis of frozen sperm. Uh, Sandro, maybe about the effect of freezing on, on um, DNA fragmentation. And, and Matt, to you about processing frozen sperm, maybe straight out of uh, freezing solutions, whether that would work. So can you just briefly comment, uh, each of you, on something to do with frozen sperm? I think um, Ashok first. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Um, so frozen sperm typically, uh, when it is brought to the room temperature, uh, have uh, lower uh, motion characteristics such as motility uh, and velocity. Uh, I mean, nothing else changes. I mean, of course, the sperm function will go down because of the membrane damage. The count will not change. So we tested um, lens hook at uh, different uh, uh, ranges of motility by artificially uh, creating the changes in motility by exposing them to uh, a chemical to reduce the motility. So we brought it to uh, a different range between 10% to 30% and, and so forth. And uh, um, we found that the results are highly accurate and reliable uh, when compared to manual semen analysis across different uh, ranges of motility, which are displayed in poor samples, such as in frozen thawed sample. Okay. Um, Sandro, can you comment on frozen sperm yeah. and maybe DNA fragmentation? Yeah, my pleasure. The, uh, the, the cryopreservation process actually uh, affect DNA fragmentation. The data that we have uh, mostly uh, 
uh, indicate that the DNA fragmentation after uh, towing is more related to single strand breaks rather than the double strand breaks. So this is important because this again point out in the effect of oxidative stress. For instance, in our studies with uh, using testicular sperm and also in our clinical practice, uh, Danny, we always use fresh sperm. I mean, if I have to take sperm from the testicle, I use fresh sperm for ICSI, not frozen sperm. So I think it's a, a co-founder that we need to control for. I would, I would say for the clinician, try to avoid, let's say, the free, a freezing sperm uh, to use later on if the patient has, let's say, high DNA fragmentation. Um, may I add uh, a comment to uh, the same point that uh, Sandro uh, talked about uh, using the CD method, I believe. For tunnel, that is not an issue uh, because we do have to freeze the sperm uh, and then uh, run the analysis uh, later on. So the changes uh, in the uh, DNA are minimal. Uh, we don't see any changes because we do have controls both uh, uh, control in terms of actual sample collected from a normal healthy individual as well as assay control or the kit control. Um, so doing that tunnel uh, using flow cytometry on a fresh sample is generally not possible because it's a fairly uh, long labor oriented uh, uh, procedure. So even uh, Dr. Don Evanson who has uh, uh, done thousands of SESA related techniques, uh, uh, related tests, uh, um, has uh, uh, standardized the method using frozen spermatozoa. Okay. So if I can just, uh, just add something, uh, Danny. Well, I think it's important to control for a viability uh, because what Ashok is, is, is saying is that if you have, a, uh, let's say, a, a method in which you can actually look at viable sperm and then assess sperm DNA fragmentation in viable sperm. This is an important thing because uh, just for a, a, clinical, uh, a, a clinical example, if I have a patient come into the clinic and in the semen analysis, I have, let's say, 20% viability only, I mean, 80% dead sperm. Well, if I do sperm DNA fragmentation testing, it won't be reliable because it will show 80% sperm DNA fragmentation in terms of the DFI. So viability is an important confounder that we need to control for. What I am trying to imply is that if that's simple, the viability is very low, the information we, we get from the sperm DNA fragmentation testing is not very strong because obviously the test also evaluate that sperm as apoptotic, fragmented chromatin, and that will make the situation a little bit uh, more complicated to interpret. So viability is important to check when we are looking at sperm DNA fragmentation. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacques, do you have any I'll final questions or do you want to round up? Sorry, Matt. Um, yeah, it's 4, 436. If, if, yeah. so Matt, if you, had, if you had something to say there, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say that, that frozen sperm samples are some of our, our most enthusiastic users. Uh, it can be used with a frozen sample by diluting with, with media and, and processed in the device as uh, though it were a, just like a, a, a fresh sample. Yeah, I just maybe just one more general question which, which comes up in, in several of the questions that, that uh, attendees have asked, uh, which is in, in this time of COVID-19, is there anything you can recommend in, the ter in terms of your clinical care and how you, how you prepare sperm? I mean, in the case of, of, of the Zymet device, have you guys looked at, at, at viral loads? Uh, I, I guess it's early on and probably those studies need to be done, but if Sandro and Ashok, if you have any comments on COVID-19 uh, and sperm preparation, particularly in the case of IUI and, and of course IVF. Um. The IUI and IVF in our clinic is closed uh, for the moment, so we have no um, experience in uh, um, to, to, to discuss that. So our work is strictly diagnostic at this time, only uh, related to semen analysis and uh, cryopreservation of oncological patients. Uh, uh, so I, I don't 
know um, how to respond to this question with uh, respect to, uh, sure. I think maybe uh, somebody else can uh, comment on this part. Sure. Uh, Mark, are you well, suggesting social distancing of individual sperm by <laughs> microfluidics? <laughs> Well, the data that we have that we have available for other coronavirus and also, let's say, this coronavirus, very limited concerning the human specimens, uh, we have very few studies. One study uh, is uh, a head of print in fertility trailery showing that the patients did not show, let's say, um, viral contamination in sperm specimens in a small group of men who he covered. Re, uh, who recovered from COVID-19. I mean, this study provides some evidence, but this is not obviously uh, strong enough for us to say, let's not pay attention in the lab. I think uh, uh, during this pandemic, we have put together two papers, one paper in andrology, it's now a head of print accepted in andrology in terms of what the andrology should look at during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Jack. And I think uh, we need to protect the sample in the lab. I mean, from the staff, the embryologists, technicians, that could be asymptomatic and then contaminate. So we need to use good laboratory practices, even with more caution that we already do uh, routinely. And also the patient could actually have some sort of effect in, in the reproductive organs. We have evidence from previous uh, coronavirus about orchitis. Yeah. So it could be that high viral load could shed through sperm. We don't have this evidence yet. Mm -hmm. The uh, first indication shows that the semen might be protected, but we need more, more data. Yes. Uh, Matt, did you want to add anything to that? We don't have data one way or another on the presence of coronavirus in samples that are used, uh, that come out of a Zymote device. However, we can speak a little bit to the social distancing in the lab and, and changing workflow amongst staff, uh, needing less time to process samples, needing fewer staff, uh, less hands-on time helps uh, uh, speak to some of those things that, that uh, yeah. Dr. Estevez was talking about, keeping staff separate in the, in the lab space. Of course. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we, we, uh, there are still uh, more than 700 uh, sperm nerds online. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending um, uh, uh, this session. Uh, I would very much like to thank again Marlene Engel for preparing the session and hope she and her family will do well during these difficult times. We'd particularly like to thank the three speakers, of course. Thank you, all three, uh, and my co-moderator and sperm nerd, Danny Sakas from <laughs> Boston you. IVF. Um, also, thank you to the organizing committee, the usual players, Peter, Thomas, Shaista, Marianne, and then, of course, a whole list of, uh, of panelists, Alison, Eva, Brian, Mattis, Cynthia, and Liso, and, and I probably have forgotten a few. Uh, well, I would like to encourage all of you who are in the audience uh, to contact I3, if you would like to help or create or submit some website content or have some other ideas. Uh, we have over 15 embryology and science organizations who have pledged their support. Um, so if you have any other ideas, please contact us and please join us this coming Friday. Same time, same station for session 12, patient friendly and minimal approaches in assisted reproduction. This will be a big debate between control freaks and minimalists. Um, so please join us. Don't be shy. Uh, you're all welcome. It will be hosted by Dr. Dean Moorbeck. You'll, you'll find out what, he, what side he is on. Uh, and myself, and you will find out what side I am on. So stay safe and uh, see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.